the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. In Jesus, we too are blessed to be a blessing. In this series, we will look at five everyday ways to love our neighbours and change the world. We begin with prayer, we listen, we eat, we serve, and we share our story. This is BLESS. So today, as we've been looking through this kind of thing, we're using a little phrase called BLESS. Uh, and uh, it goes like uh, beginning prayer, listen, eat, which was an extraordinarily popular concept when we got there. Okay, uh, and last week we, we talked about serving other people, and today we come to kind of part five, five A, if you like, which is about sharing our story, uh, our story, and the Jesus story. There's kind of two stories going on: our own Jesus story and the, the story of Jesus. And our story is the impact that Jesus has had on our life, uh, what he's brought us from and what he's landed us into and the way that he's pointing us in the right direction in our lives. And every one of us who's a Christian has got our Jesus story. So David, we really want to hear your Jesus story. So start off by telling us a little about yourself and what you do from day to day. Yeah, during the day, so my, my work, among other things, basically I work for an organisation called Prison Fellowship Scotland, so my day-to-day -day can look very different. Uh, some days I could be sitting in the office, pulling my hair out, bald out my face. Uh, other days I could be travelling all, all over Scotland, visiting various prisons, um, meeting with volunteers, meeting with chaplains, um, running alpha courses, running fellowship groups, running restorative justice courses, and, uh, and just various prisons. So my... My official role is Projects Manager for uh, Prison Fellowship Scotland, so that just means I manage lots of projects, obviously, it's the clues in the name a wee bit, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it can, look, it can look very different for day to day, but actually COVID had a, had a massive effect on um, prisons as well, they went, in, they went into proper lockdown, so um, out of the 15 prisons in Scotland, there was, I think we had access to about two or three during lockdown, so actually what we're seeing in the last kind of six to nine months, is doors beginning to open again, so um, they're getting their money's worth without me at the moment. They've yeah. got me going everywhere, which is, I love it and I enjoy it, so yeah. Excellent, that's... so that kind of prison ministry is giving a bit of a hint to something of your Jesus story, so uh, I'm just going to give you the floor now. Would you like to just like tell us, how, yep. how did you, you said 12 years ago you became yep. a Christian? Yeah, So just give us your story, how you came to Jesus and what came of um, so as I said, I, I became a Christian in 2000, it was between 2010 and 11, and I became a Christian while I was in prison. Um, I grew up in Rutherglen, which is not too far from here, and um, with my two brothers, my mum and dad, and um, kind of, it was, it was becoming quite a, pretty apparent that I was somebody who was standing out for the crowd a wee bit, my behaviour wasn't the best, and um, I was beginning to get into trouble, even in school I was known as probably the class clown and uh, being kicked out of classes and I, I never went unnoticed with the teachers and it wasn't for good reasons. And um, kind of up, up into my early teens, just, to, just as I went into high school and stuff, I um, started to kind of hang about the streets. My dad was um, just, I think it was when I was 12, my dad was diagnosed with cancer uh, in the October of 2000. And by the January of 2001, he had passed away, lung cancer, and basically um, affected his spine and stuff. And um, yeah, so he was he he was paralysed and stuff, and was in hospital. And um, he passed away quite quickly, so there wasn't a lot of warning. I don't remember. I may be wrong, but I don't remember really knowing what was going on. I think people were trying to kind of shield and protect. I obviously had two brothers. I was 12. My other brother, I think, was 14, and my other brother, John, here. Today, I think he was 16, and um, so that was a kind of blow to the family. And um, my mum was the kind of my mum, don't want to offend my mum, but she's the kind of the softer parent. My dad was very, very authoritarian, and if he said something, you just ran, you just done it. If he said put your jammies on and you looked at your watch and it was 12 minutes past three in the afternoon, you put your jammies on and went to your bed. Um, 
he didn't have to tell you things twice. You done it, and that was that. And my mum was a bit more, you know, if my dad was out at night and we were pushing the boundaries with bedtime or whatever. And like every kid, we wanted toast at night. We would, we would be like, Mum, can we get toast? And we'd eventually grind her down and we would get it. But if my dad, we heard my dad coming back, we'd all just sprint back into our beds and pretend we'd been sleeping for hours. Um, so when, so when, when my dad passed away, he that basically left a, a sort of gap of a, a kind of role model gap and also a kind of a person who to keep you in line gap. And as I said, I was twelve. I'd no longer went into high school. I started to kind of by this point I was hanging about the streets of Rutherglen, the mean streets of Rutherglen, the concrete ghetto, and um, uh, me and a bunch of other boys who we were just hanging about the streets. We were getting into bother with the police. Uh, we were starting to kind of drink, um, smoke a bit of smoke a bit of hash, take drugs, hanging about the parks. Just looking back as an adult, you know, when you're young you just think it's all fun and it's all it's just part of what you do. But looking back as an adult with kids I can just see it was just we were complete delinquents. We were just running about causing causing a bit of a trouble in the community and just harassing people and, and as I got older we were getting into we were getting into fights and uh, in Rutherglen where we lived, right in central Rutherglen, we were surrounded with um different gangs so we were we were central rather than i grew up rather than main street and surround the, the there was eight different gangs that surrounded us we went to school in different areas where there was gangs and um my friends were beginning to get involved in violence and gang fighting and we were hanging about the streets we were drunk we were taking drugs and the natural progression for me was to get involved but i managed to i managed to kind of hold off till i was probably about 15 and then peer pressure and all the rest of the excitement and adventure and being tanked up on cheap cider and um, gave me Dutch courage and I, I began to get involved in uh, gang violence as well but kind of for the age of 12 up into 16 I'd been getting arrested you know I was hanging about in the streets more I had a, I had a big brother who, who terrorized me and made my life quite miserable and there was a lot of violence and so I, I, I can see that I, I, looking back I seen that I never really felt safe I really felt safe at home and I felt safer hanging about the streets in a big crowd there was a camaraderie there was an acceptance um, with my mates and we were all kind of between the ages of kind of 13, 14, 15 but then there was, there was guys above us that were kind of 17, 18, 19 and they were involved in gang violence and stuff and by just naturally we became the, the, the younger the younger guys coming up and I don't know if you know anything about gang violence but it's a, in, in Glasgow it's a lot about reputation and upholding that reputation and we, there was pressure put on us to uphold the reputation of how violent you were and we, we tried our best to do that madly, you know, we, we got involved in, in all that stuff and I was getting arrested quite a lot up for the police just for, for various different things and a lot of times it was maybe running about the streets, being involved in fighting and, and arresting and I remember being involved, uh, getting arrested and being, being released and my mum coming to collect us and just there was no really... There was nothing really changing. It was just the same stuff and social work were involved. I was being sent to children's panels. I got sent to court when I was 15 for a big long list of, long list of crimes. And I remember the police telling me, um, I can't even remember when it was, probably between the age of 14 to 16. I remember the police telling me, you know, when you're 16, you'll be going to jail. When you're 16, we won't be phoning your mum. When you're 16, you won't be doing a couple of hours in the cells and getting out. And that's exactly what happened. Um, by the time... At the time I was just about to turn 16, I was already out on bail for a serious assault. We had got into a fight up at a school with another gang and a boy basically got his face cut and um, some other stuff happened to him. And uh, the police knew me by that by that point and they didn't they they'd taken a disliking to me, although I wasn't innocent, I'd done a lot of stuff, but the police went out of their way to, to make sure that they were gonna get me locked up and they did, and I committed lots of crimes and that's the way it went. And as soon as I turned 16, um, a couple of months after my 16th birthday, I was charged with another uh, violent offence and was went through the court system and was sent to a, a young offenders institution in Pullman, uh, which is in Falkirk. So I was sick, no long term, a couple of months after my 16th birthday, uh, I was shackled up, put in the back of a van and sent to a young offenders institution. That was a shock to the system. Um, got in there and just been like, right, survival mode, what they are doing, and just trying to learn quick on what's happening. And I remember being in these big old Victorian halls and being transported for the reception area to the <clears throat> to the halls and going in and you go in this hall and it's just dark and loud and there's lots going on and uh, people shouting and screaming and all the rest of it. Quite a, a very chaotic environment. I remember that the first time I went to prison, the prison cell door opening and just there was just a set of bunk beds and there was a guy already in there and it was just kind of like, right, that's your cellmate, door closed, complete stranger. 
And I'm standing in the cell and I'm looking about, I'm thinking, where's the toilet in here? How do you use the toilet? And the toilet was basically a bucket in the corner and a bottle in the corner. It was basically deemed against human rights and they changed it. So that was my shock to the system. Uh, but I, I'd always believed I'm probably going to end up in prison. I, I, feel, I, I knew that that's the way my life was gone and I, I, it had materialised and here I was in prison. And um, kind of from the age of 16 then on to 24, my life was quite chaotic. I was in prison, I was out of prison and it was just, you know, the people, the term that people used to describe it, it's kind of like a revolving door. You just go in and you come out and you go in and you come out and nothing changes. And you, uh, when you're in prison, you just spend time running about other criminals. All they talk about is crime, all they talk about is violence, drug dealing, whatever. It's just, it's just a chaotic environment in general. And I basically came out worse, I think, than when I went in. And um, yeah, that, that just that just continued for kind of the age of 16 to 24. So eight year period, I was... Uh, sent to prison quite a lot, uh, but it's sitting in front of juries, judges, um, all the rest of it, being charged with lots of various crimes. And a lot of the time it was violence, and then a lot of the time it was um, violence against police. So I just really hated the police. I just had a real bitterness towards the police. And um, yeah, I won't go too much into that because I don't want to get carried away on how I feel about the police. But now I, now I look at police and say, you know, they need Jesus, you know, God loves them and God's been able to do something in me to change how I see them. But back then, they hated me and I hated them and I just seen them as a big gang who got, they got away with the sort of crimes that they were locking me up for, you know. They were, they were locking me up for an assault, but yeah, when I got into the cells, they were, they were kicking, kicking me and punching me and stuff. So there was a lot of hypocrisy and, and I hated that. But I remember when I was, um, I remember when I would go into some prison cells, this is probably when I'm kind of 19, 20, I'd go into prison cells, there'd be Gideon's Bibles in the cells, and I'd try and read it and make sense of it, but you know, if you, you, sometimes when you read the Bible, it's, it's hard to make sense of it, especially if you're really new to it. And I remember just praying, you know, to God. My mum tried her best, she took us to chapel and stuff, she tried to instill some sort of good morals in us growing up, and I remember having some sort of belief in God, but never really knew too much about him. And I remember just thinking when I was in prison, you know, my, my life is at a place where I don't see an end to this. The way, the way, the way it's going for me is the crimes are just going to keep getting more serious. I'm going to end up potentially really hurting somebody or killing them because I was carrying and using knives and weapons and all the rest of it. This kind of culture where, where we grew up. With. So the, the sort of things I was involved in were getting more serious. So I believe that either somebody's going to kill me or I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to end up in jail for the rest of my life, or I'm going to end up in the morgue. And I remember praying and just saying, God, I don't know. I don't know too much about you. I don't know if you're real, but if you're real, help me. Um, that was it. It was a simple prayer of asking for help. And my door never swung open, and Jesus wasn't standing there with his sandals and a big cross, and he didn't have all the answers. But what happened is that God began to bring Christians into my life. He began to bring these people into my, my life that were speaking differently, that they were different influences. And I came to realise that while I was in prison that they had fellowship groups that they ran. They had basically Bible studies or house groups or whatever you want to call them. A place where you could go um, and, and ask questions and it was a safe place. And, you know, these people tried to answer, these people tried their best to answer your mad questions about dinosaurs and UFOs and all the rest of it. And we've been doing there and... Uh, we journeyed, I journeyed a bit like that and, um, you know, something was going on inside me. I was beginning to be challenged by the lifestyle that I was living. You know, I was involved in, in all sorts of crime. I was involved in selling drugs at one point as well and uh, stuff, that I'm, stuff that I'm not proud of and done things to make money that were, that were very, very immoral. Um, but... My times in prison, it's a bit of a haze because I was in and out quite a lot. So my, my coming to Jesus was a bit of a, it was a few year period. But as I said, he was bringing people into my life. And um, I remember when I was a, I was a prison in Kilmarnock and uh, they had people coming in and sharing their stories, you know, and sharing about how their lives had been touched by God. And it's kind of what we are doing today, you know, when, when, we, when we experience this living God, Jesus, when he touches a life, he completely transforms a life. And it's our job to tell other people about this. Why would we want to keep this a secret? You know, if any person in this room won the lottery, we wouldn't be able to know tell our pals. We wouldn't be able to know keep it a secret. So this, this, this is even better than winning the lottery because this is eternal consequences, this decision, this choice to, to come and be, uh, follow Jesus. So 
um, I, I, I became a Christian. They had people coming in, and it was over a period of time. And I said, you know what? This is this is what I'm this is what I'm looking for. This is what I need. You know, I need forgiveness. I've done so much wrong, and I've and I accept that I'm not perfect, and I accept that I've made a lot of mistakes. I need a for, I need forgiveness. I need this. I need this new narrative. I need this this Jesus. I need this hope because the life that I'm living at the moment is completely hopeless. And as I said, I only see it going two ways. And I became a Christian when I was in prison. And 2000, it was 10 or 11, and I thought, great, that's me a Christian, life's going to be great, I'm never going to sin, I'm going to go outside and live an up, upstanding moral life, and that just wasn't the case, I came out and things were just worse, I was attending church, but I had my feet in both camps, I was coming to church, but I was also involved in selling drugs and other estate, and God, God was working on my heart, but he was, he was taking his time actually, but he was being very, you know, God's gracious and merciful, you know, and he put people in my life, um, who, who challenged me but loved me and showed me showed me the grace of God and over a period of time you know things began to change for me and there's a there's a there's a word that that describes how we change behaviour and we turn for that way and go that way and it's repentance I was, began to repent and change and the, the the guy is in the room the, the youth pastor it was part of the church that went to today and I'm sure his uh, his um, perception of the story is very different I I thought I was quite I've done it quite good but maybe it took five. Five years, Phil, I don't know. Um, it, took, it took a while for me to change, but he, he was very gracious in, in journeying with me. And uh, yeah, I found myself back in prison as a Christian. And I remember just saying, you know, I've t the Bible talks about taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, in one of the Psalms, I'd tasted and seen, I'd tasted and seen what it would, what it would mean to be a Christian and how, how good and how fulfilling that life is. And uh, But yeah, I was still involved in stuff and got into a fight and found myself back in prison. And I remember when I was in Low Moss Prison in Glasgow, recommitting my life to God. And uh, I remember just saying, God, when I get out this time, I really want to fully give myself to you. And I got released for that, that time in prison. I went back to my church. I started to fully commit. I started to get involved in everything and anything, recovery groups, helping at the food bank, whatever it was. I was baptised when I was 21. Um, and I remember talking to Pastor Phil and just saying, you know, I feel, I, I don't know, I didn't know how to hear God, but I had a sense that God was telling me to go to Bible college, and I never even knew what Bible college was. I knew the church ran a Bible college, and I just thought, I'm going to go there, and it'll be like fellowship, it'll help me read the Bible. I'd signed up for a two-year leadership college, and uh, that was that. I began to grow and change and be around about different people at, the, at that time as well, and that made an impact in my life. And then through my Christian life, I've just went from strength to strength. I, as I said, I grew up in Rutherglen, we ended up planting a church in Rutherglen. One of my mates who I grew up with, who was a bit wild as well, and he he became he came to Christ and he ended up pastoring the church. And me and him basically were the leaders in the church. We were two of the two rogues for Rutherglen, and um, people used to cross the street few years ago in case we were wanting to rob them or fight them or whatever it was, and now they were crossing the street because we were brandishing Bibles at them and brandishing <laughs> gospel tracts and asking them if they had any pain in their body, can we pray for them? And they're just like, "What have you just been smoking? Something's happened here." But actually, that's the, that's the reality of when, when Jesus touches life. You know, it's, it's complete transformation. And people run about it are just like, what has happened in this guy's life? And I've not really went into detail uh, too much. But, you know, I was probably, you know, if you'd ask my mum, she'll probably give you different stories and ask my brother on the things that they've experienced over, over, over the years. But I was probably one of the worst people. I had the worst reputation um, for all kinds of stuff where I grew up. And, yeah, when I was at probably one of my lowest points in prison, you know, where society says that guy's a monster, lock him up, throw away the keys, just going to be a criminal his whole life. Actually, God, God was in that prison. He was in that prison and he was, he was opening my heart to his goodness and his mercy and his love. And through that process, I have became a Christian. I, as I said, married with a family, living, living, living a good life. And actually, when I, I remember coming out of prison, and most people don't want to go back to prison. You know, if you, I don't know if anybody's been in prison. I won't ask you to put your hand up because they'll embarrass you. Um, <laughs> But I can tell we're looking at you. I know there's a few. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. I've got, got too much into the jokes there. But um, aye, he 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 touched and changed my life in a way that it, I can't hide. I can't hide it. And that there's people around about me that, that that know they just know something has happened. And that, as I said, it's my job to proclaim this and testify about this because God's. God is so good and God is so misrepresented through the church so much and people have bad ideas about God but God is so, so loving, he's so gracious, he's so merciful, he gives us so many chances where we are rebels, he chases us down and he loves us, he gives us this unmerited favour, he offers us his grace 
The fact that we wake up and have breath every morning is mercy. And that's what God offers. And that's what we want to tell people. We don't want to be religious and Bible bash people and say, come to church because this is what we do. We say our prayers and all the rest of it. This is life. This is a complete new life. And we're just talking about the adventure that we live in this life. You know, we're dedicating our kids because we value this. We value God so much. We value bringing them up, up in the faith. And one of the most important things to me in life is that these kids find Jesus because it has eternal consequences. And when all is said and done and everything disappears and just goes away, we'll, we'll have to stand before God and we'll have to give an account for our life. Nobody is exempt. You might go through your life and put your fingers in your ears and get busy with work and think, oh, that's not for me. The religious nutcases are over there. I'll stay over here. But the reality is you can run for so long, but when you die, you'll stand before Jesus and you'll have to give an account for your life. And that's not to scare you. That's just the truth. And there's two places. I grew up believing there was three places. There was heaven, hell, and purgatory. No matter what you've done, you just floated about in this place and eventually you go in. But the reality is there's two places. There's heaven and there's hell. And the choices that we make on this earth determine where we go in eternity. And that's why I'm so passionate about telling people this because it's not just about having a good life and getting off drugs and staying out of prison. Some of my mates think Christianity is a, form, a formula for staying out of prison. They go, oh, well, it's good that you're not getting to jail anymore. But it's more than that. It's about eternity. Where will you go when you die? And it's not about how you behave or how you perform in church. It's about whether you are willing to come to God humbly and say, God, you know what? I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I know I'm, I've done wrong. But I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'm going, to, I'm going to look to him for my eternal resting place. I'm going to look to him for forgiveness. David said at the start, he came and died on a cross. He was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he was raised for the grave. He lived a sacrificial life. He came to this earth. He sacrificed for us, for drug dealers like me, for convicts like me, for people who robbed people and done things. God sent his son to the earth to be nailed to a cross, to be humiliated, to be stamped, to have a thorn of crowns crushed on his skull, to be spat on, to be killed and hung on a cross for the very people that were doing it to him. That is the gracious nature of God's love. Yeah. You know, while we are rebels, while we're away doing our own thing, he sent his precious son to hang and die on a cross so that if we come to God through that sacrifice, through that blood that was shed on the cross, if we come through that, no knowing all the answers, no being perfect Christians or perfect human beings and putting our trust in him, God will forgive us. He'll offer forgiveness. And the baggage and the mess that we carry in life, that will begin to clear up over time. And that's what's happened in my life. I became a Christian in prison. I was forgiven in that moment. But over the last 10 to 12 years, the baggage and the mess that was my life has began to change up. And your mess may look very different from my mess. You know, there might not be people who have been involved in drugs and violence in prison. But the Bible talks about how we've all fallen short of God's standards. Nobody, nobody born into this earth, nobody walking about here with oxygen in their lungs meets God's standards. And that's the reality. We all need forgiveness. We all need a saviour. And I believe wholeheartedly that that saviour is Jesus Christ. He's the one I opened up my life to. He's the one who came into my life and radically transformed and changed. And that's for every person. Yeah. It's not for people to just go, oh, that's great for your life. Nice, nice you've got a good job and you've gone you've got into prisons and stuff. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's standards. We are going to stand before God one day. There's going to be a judgment. What side will you be on? There'll be left and there'll be right. There'll be people that approach Jesus on that day and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Or there'll be people that will approach him on that day and he'll say, come in, my good and faithful servant, welcome. God celebrates and parties when people that don't know him become his children. To what extent do you think, you know, the, your kind of journey of faith, how, how has it affected, as far as you can see, the kind of your, your immediate family and friends? Does, has it had a kind of a ripple effect with him? Yeah, I think a lot of friends sadly avoid because you know they, they you know this the gospel challenges your life you know it demands an answer it demands you know it, it, it confronts a lot of my friends have grew up and doing their own thing and uh, you know I keep in touch with a lot of people as best I can but you know some people it's, it's not for them and that's what they think and that's cool my immediate family I had a brother who passed away in um, 2014 and um, thankfully before he um, passed away he made prof professional faith was baptized so I believe that I'll see him again and I know there's hope yeah. for that. 
uh, to see him again. My mum has became a Christian. She's, she's been baptised, became a Christian and stuff. And she's hopefully, don't tell us, because she's sitting there, she's hopefully going to join this church. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's had an effect. It has different effects on people. I just hope that... Um, you know, I don't, I, at, the very, at the very start of my journey, I just needed to tell everybody about this, but probably told them in ways that wasn't helpful. And I think sometimes we can be like that. We're just overzealous, and sometimes it can push people away. What I do now is I just pray for my family, and I, um, I, 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 I hope that when they look at our lives, they can see something of Jesus, and they can see something that attracts them, because life without Christ is completely hopeless. You can have the big house, you can have the nice car, the lovely family, the great job, everything else, but actually... There's an emptiness inside. There's a loneliness and an emptiness uh, that only God, that only God can fill. You know, it's that that connection with God that He's created us, us to have a connection with Him. And until we, until we discover that and line up to that truth, that there'll be something that just doesn't click, and we'll try and fill it with drugs and women and alcohol and work and cars and whatever else. And it, it doesn't fit. Jesus is the only answer. That's that's the reality. But I try. I try and just let my life, my life speak, and I share testimonies about what God's doing in my life. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So again, let's just show the appreciation.